<laughs> I'm really I'm the worst presenter in the world. Um, no, okay. you're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get this party started. So, um, hi everyone, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I think most of you are probably in Europe though, uh, joining from this. So, welcome to the the first of the webinars for the. Uh, Module 1 of the Open Science MOOC on Open Principles. I'm John, I'm the founder of the MOOC, and I guess your host-ish today. Um, if you have any questions throughout the next uh, 45 minutes or so, then just pop them in the public chat, and I'll monitor that and make sure to convey them to Corinna. Uh, so yes, I'm delighted, honoured, and yeah, super happy that we have uh, Corinna Logan with us today, or Dr. Corinna Logan. So Corinna is a, a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for... Evolutionary Anthropology, uh, based in uh, Leipzig in uh, Germany. She is also one of the co-founders of the Bullied into Bad Science Initiative. Um, also one of the co-founders, I think, of the Peer Community in Ecology, um, and the founder of the Grackle Project, which is what you probably see on the screen right now. So without further ado, I'm going to shut up and turn off my webcam and pass things over to Corinna. Take it away. You are now muted. Thank you so much, John. It's exciting to be here. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this amazing community. Um, I'm here with um, Lou. He's a, a mini dachshund sitting on the... Can you see him yet? Yeah, hey, Lou. Hey, Lou. Stop licking your leg. And come up and say hi. Okay, there he is. He's got his um, coat on backwards to try and get him to stop, stop licking the wounds. So anyway, he's hanging out here with me. So when I'm looking off screen distracted, that'll be, that'll be the reason. Um, so cool. I am excited to share with you today the, the um, journey that I've been going on for the last three years. Um, it started off with me asking why I publish in particular journals. And the more I started finding out and learning about the choices that I make as a researcher and what impact they have, the darker the picture got and the more... Um, outraged I became, and the more I tried to learn how to do things differently, and what is the right way to do things, the ethical way of doing things, and um, yeah, so it started off with, um, I guess, figuring out, like, what is the, what are the basics, like, what do we need to conduct and evaluate research, and what does it depend on, so I think the fundamental process here is that people need to be able to read research, um, and so this brings up a barrier of there are a lot of there's a lot of research that's behind paywalls versus um, being open access, which is the lack of a barrier. People have to be able to understand the research that they're reading. So um, using jargon can be a barrier to this kind of a um, to, to understanding your audience understanding, and they need to be able to verify the research. So this is where it goes beyond just the, the article that you write, which is kind of like a little tiny snippet in time. There's all this other stuff that happened before that article came to be in its current form. And, and if we open up that part of the process, then readers have the ability to verify what you actually did and when it happened, and why you made certain decisions along the way. Because as we know, research changes as it doesn't go to plan. And so if you share how your plan changes, that can, um, that can, make a lot more of the research process verifiable so people can tell whether you're still doing um, valid science or research in general. And then it also depends on the ability to generate and disseminate research. So here's where we, we run into some really big walls of having a perception of prestige. So you want to publish in particular journals that have particular names, that have particular reputations in your field. Um, but these places tend to discriminate against um, certain groups of people. So tackling our implicit biases is a way to get around that. Um, and it shouldn't be based on what kind of metrics you have, like how many papers you have, or um, things like this, it, it, because those metrics are um, a re sort of a reflection of the privilege that someone has. And if we look instead at their access to opportunity and select people b based on that, it gives us a, a much better picture of, of what they're actually doing as well as it stops from discriminating against them. And then also what we're generating, a lot of the research we generate right now is really just from the wealthy individuals at wealthy institutions that can afford all of this access and open access fees and journal subscription fees, but that really discriminates against people who um, 
the ability of people, which is equally distributed across people and doesn't depend on how much money they have. So um, I want to talk about how we can remove these inequities and improve research value. And I think these two things are directly linked. So one of the things that I'm going to argue is that we need to connect the costs of our publishing choices um, with the costs of what it actually costs to publish. So close that loop and I'll show you an example in a minute. And then I'll show you that we can change our behavior to stop exploiting ourselves and to stop discriminating against other researchers and the public because all of the options we need exist right now, which I think is so exciting. And that's the part I get really excited about sharing. So we'll get through a lot of like depressing stuff, but um, there is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel, I think. So the first um, example I'll, I'll share with everyone is focused on how scholarly publishing actually works. And it addresses a few of these um, challenges, these barriers that we have, like paywalls and closed uh, research processes and a well-based system. <clears throat> So I'll take you on the life cycle of a research article. And so that's me in the center of the circle. And I am in academia, which is in the center of the circle. And I have a paper that I just got accepted at a, a journal. And I description based journal. So I think, Yay, I just got this paper accepted and it's published for free. It costs nothing. Um, but what actually happened Can is that... Just for a second. Uh, your slides aren't advancing on the screen. So okay. Whoopsie daisy. So let's see. Can you see ah, this? Yes, much better. And we can see... Okay, why, <laughs> why don't I make this bigger? Okay. And then we can do it this way. Okay. So... Much better. Thank yeah. you. you okay, yeah, no problem. So did, did everyone see this slide? The, uh, they can now. We can share. Um, if not, okay. Here's this main um, outline slide that I'll, I'll keep coming back to about how we um, evaluating research depends on the ability to read, understand, and verify, and disseminate, and generate research. Okay, so here we are. And now everyone can see the circle, hopefully. Um, so inside the circle is me in academia. I submit this paper. And I think, yay, it cost me nothing. Um, but what actually happened was that um, academia paid about 5,000 US dollars on my behalf for this, this one article to be published out there. And that's because the university libraries and other institutions who want to be able to read these papers have to buy subscriptions to them. And it's on the order of millions per year that they're that each institute is spending um, for these for these um, subscriptions. So let me advance slides that way. Okay. Now, what we don't see included in this five thousand dollar figure is the editor and reviewer time, which goes into the quality control of the um, article. Right, we're the ones doing the editing and the reviewing, and so if we just look at reviewer time. It ends up costing about 1.9 billion pounds per year in kind globally for reviewer time. So you're a researcher at a university and your salary, um, the time that you spend on reviewing is donated by the salary that you're getting from your university. So that's, <clears throat> that's a lot of effort that we're spending to do this quality control and quality Improvements of the um, research outputs that get out there, that get into the published literature. So, of this five thousand dollars that academia paid on my behalf to publish this one article at the subscription-based journal, about thirty-seven percent of that goes to shareholders, because the top four, the biggest four um, publishing companies, are privately owned, publicly traded companies. So um, their goals are to maximize profits, and they're really good at it. Um, and this is in contrast, like direct opposition to the goal of academia, which is to share research, because we're generating knowledge, and shouldn't knowledge be out there for the world to see, and shouldn't knowledge be free? So um, there are a lot of people making money off of the papers that we're giving them that we think is for free. Um, so it's coming at a high cost. Actually. 
I so the, the top four, the biggest four publishers are Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, Wiley, and Springer Nature. And um, it's actually estimated that Elsevier's profits are more like fifty percent. Um, regardless, these profits are larger than Google, so they're making a killing off of what we give them for free. And what is it that they're actually doing? Because if we're doing the quality control for the publishers for free, um, reviewers and editors, then what they're doing is formatting, which we can do in Overleaf or in our studio using our markdown. Like, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous um, if we want to see like what the actual costs of publishing are. Okay, so this paper then goes to uh, a paywall. So, to the read by the scholarly rich. And that means um, other researchers who are at institutions that can afford um, to purchase these journal subscriptions that cost millions of pounds per year. And we're discriminating against the people who can't afford to get behind this paywall. And that's people like medical doctors, hospitals can't afford these journal subscriptions. Um, patients can't understand their health um, problems because they can't get access to the literature. And the public can't um, get access to it either. So we're indirectly discriminating against most people when we publish behind paywalls. And this is unfortunate because it's the public who actually funds the research in the first place. So this is a really, um, broken life cycle. The money is being drained outside to ship publicly, just to the shareholders of these publicly traded companies, and the public can't read it, but the public is funding research. It's just this um, very exploitative life cycle. So I want to share how we can do an ethical, what I call the ethical route. And this is one example um, of the life cycle of, a, of an article. But first, I want to set the, the principles for what is an ethical framework that we, and uh, how can we think about an ethical framework. <clears throat> and so I argue that it's really based on three pillars. And this is that researchers and publishers actually have a re responsibility to the public to provide them with free access to publicly funded products which are a common good, and that the publishers of research products have a responsibility to researchers to value the generation and packaging of the knowledge, and third, that researchers have a responsibility to the public to conduct rigorous research because it will serve as the foundation for the advancement of future discoveries, and it provides the best value for money and earns public trust, which is particularly crucial in these times, these political times. So based on this framework, what is the life cycle on the ethical route of a particular um, paper? And so usually this pops up one at a time. I'll just take you through with my mouse. So I'm here again. That's me in the center of the circle. And what I did was I submitted my paper to a 100% open access journal. And so um, it's not a hybrid journal. A hybrid journal is where the publisher charges um, universities subscription fees to access the research behind paywalls. And, and then authors can also pay a fee to get some, their article published open access so anyone can read it. But what actually happens with these hybrid journals is that they make even more money than if they were just um, charging subscription fees. Because they say that they'll offset costs. Well, some publishers say they offset costs. So if you pay, pay them an article processing charge, an APC, they say, oh, we deduct that money from subscriptions. But if you look at the contract, that's not actually how it works. And so some places deduct up to like 25% of open access charges from their subscriptions somehow. But um, it's definitely not um, equaling out, and it's still um, it, it gains them a lot more money than just being 100% open access or just being subscription-based. So that's why I say that Coda involves only 100% open access journals. And the exciting thing is, is that you get to then choose how much you're spending on publishing, because how much you're spending of the public spending on publishing this particular article. Um, you can spend zero dollars that there are a lot of journals that are free, and actually something that I learned from one of John Tennant's talks last year was that I think it's something around 70% of open access journals charge 
no article processing charges. So it's free at most open access journals. And then you do get a sliding scale. So there are um, there are some journals that charge a lot of money, um, like Nature. Their open access journals charge something on the order of five thousand dollars, which is outrageous given the costs of what it actually publishing costs for a particular article. Okay, so now we're we're here on the ethical route. We choose how much <clears throat> it costs to publish this particular article. The editor and reviewer time are the same, so it's donated um, on behalf of the universities. So that is the same as in the uh, exploitative route, except for in this route, that donation is kept inside academia. It's not being drained to um, shareholders and, and, and that, that effort being lost, because the profits contribute to academia through the, academia through the publisher. And this is where I think of publishers as... So this is another thing you get to choose. You get to choose which journal you submit to and which publisher they're at. So I think of when I give a, a research output, an article to a particular journal, I think of it as me having a choice, you know, like at the end of the year when you make your year-end charitable donations. Um, if I'm going to pay an article processing charge, I want to you make sure that it's going to a publisher that's going to use that funding for academia or for something that I particularly believe in. So for example, I consider PRJ an ethical publisher because it's almost free to publish there. And um, what they are doing is they're trying to reinvent how we do publishing and make it better for researchers and the public. So they're investing a lot in making things better for academia. So the profits that they're, they do make some profits, but they're reinvesting a lot of it into academia. So for me, that counts as a, a worthy charitable donation. So now because this is an open access article, it's available to read by the public. We don't indirectly discriminate against anyone. Anyone can read it. And that's great because the public funds the research. So it's a, it's a closed life loop life cycle. So it's a much more sustainable process. And one of the exciting things is that what's been found by Aaron McKiernan and colleagues is that there are actually a lot of benefits to publishing open access articles because obviously you get more readers and that results in more citations and media attention. And then for the authors, it actually can land them in situations of having more job opportunities and funding opportunities. So it's a real plus to, to go this route. All right, so that's the my initial uh, going into the rabbit hole of starting to ask questions about scholarly publishing. Why am I submitting journals, or why am I submitting papers to these particular journals? Um, it led me down this rabbit hole, but then it led me onto other topics as well, and it just kept spreading and spreading. So another topic that I wanted to touch on with you was um, closed peer review, in that it's a confidential process which makes it unverifiable. <clears throat> and this addresses some of the um, four of the of the barriers that I've I've listed on this slide that are barriers to reading, verifying, and generating and disseminating research. So in a traditional peer review process where it's closed, um, what the reader sees is the article. What they don't see is the peer review. So the peer reviewer's comments, the editor's comments, the back and forth between the editors and the reviewers and the authors, the rebuttals, and then the final decision for whether to um, publish this particular article. Readers also don't see the preprint that was usually um, submitted to the journal unless people are putting that up out there, which is happening more and more these days. And if you, unless you do a registered report, people also can't see the plan, the, research, the study plan, which I'll talk more about later. So if a reader can only see the paper, the final result of this whole research process that happened, then, and, and the peer review, which is the quality control part of the process, if that happens behind closed doors, then we can't do quality control. And 
I don't know about you, but as an author, I have experienced reviewers that are um, definitely biased against what I'm doing for some reason. They're subjective. They're just giving like one line saying, you can't do that, but they're not saying why um, or what's wrong with this. Or you know, They're just giving these kind of very subjective statements. Um, and this can't be caught if this is all happening confidentially. And the editors here, I argue, are really key to maintaining these high standards and the quality of the peer review process. So I became a, a, an associate editor at Royal Society Open Science in 2016, and that's where I started learning about um, like the power an editor has and the power we should be exerting over the reviewers to make the reviewers um, conform to good practices if they're not already. So I think editors here have a, a big responsibility to really manage this process so that the authors aren't getting these crappy reviews, um, that the reviews are as actually useful. So uh, I have a, a closed peer review horror story um, that really, really opened my eyes to this process and why closed peer review is so terrible. And I'll, I'll take you through that now. Um, so what happened was that I reviewed this paper from a well-known journal in my field, and I raised a lot of issues as a reviewer, and I, I thought that some were actually insurmountable. So I was questioning whether this was even going to be um, publishable. The editor um, sent an email to the authors, and I was CC'd as a reviewer, um, and the decision was to do a major revision, and then I heard nothing from the um, from the editor. No more emails. All of a sudden, like three months later or something, I got this email from another editor at that journal saying, hey, we just accepted this article, and we'd love it if you would write a commentary on it, and that would be published alongside the article. And I looked at the article, and it was the article I reviewed, and I compared the accepted version against the I reviewed, and there were almost no changes made, in fact. I think the only change um, that was made was something that the editor suggested. And so it turns out like there were actually factual, there were several factual errors in this, in this article that this journal was going to publish. And so I went to the editor, the handling editor, and the senior editors, and the society presidents, it was a society journal, and I brought this up and said, look, I don't think you want to publish something that's actually incorrect. Um, here are, uh, you know, what's going on? I, I don't understand how um, this could happen. And the only responses I got were that they all refused to um, to acknowledge that there was anything. They didn't even mention anything about quality. They just said, oh, we totally trust our, our editors, and we're, um, we totally back them. Like, that's all they said. And so I was just so frustrated. And... And I said, all right, fine. Well, if I give you this list of the actual, just the pure factual errors, do you want to, like, have the authors make it so it's not completely incorrect? And so the, they said, the editor said, oh, sure, I'll see if they want to. Um, so this article was in a double-blind peer review process. So normally I sign my reviews, but when it's double-blind, I respect the double-blind and I don't sign. So um, somehow my name was attached to the feedback the editors gave the authors, and so they could see that I was one of the reviewers. And now they mentioned me in the acknowledgments of this non-peer-reviewed, published article. And it looks like I supported it, but no one can tell that I was the complete opposite because they can't see the peer review history. It's locked behind closed doors. It was just, it was just outrageous for me. I, I was so appalled at the behavior of everyone at every level of the process. In fact, the president of the society was the worst. Um, yeah, sent me a pretty nasty email. So um, obviously, there's quality, there's individual variation in editors and reviewers. And if you don't acknowledge that, then you're just blind. So the fact that we need to do quality control is not a surprise. And the journals should be doing quality control. So if the peer review history is open, then anyone can do quality control, and we can start to do research on it, meta-research on it. So now this, 
whole experience is why I decide now where I donate my reviewer and editor time. And I only review and I only edit um, for journals and for articles that are that the peer review history is going to be published alongside the article so everyone can see it. And there are several journals that do this um, these days, which is really exciting. So um, I just refuse and I, and I send people um, this email when I decide to, uh, when I get a review request and I say I, I won't um, review this paper because of these, it doesn't conform to my ethics in these particular ways. And that's on my website in case you're interested in the, the text for that. So um, one of the cool things that kind of came from this process as well is that it really got me thinking about solutions and I was able to implement a solution in collaboration with Dita Lucas um, at Peer Community Inn. So Peer Community Inn is a nonprofit organization run by researchers for researchers. And, and what it does is it provides peer review of um, preprints. So you put your preprint at, for example, I'm a biologist, so I put it at BioArchive, and then you submit that preprint to the link to that preprint to Peer Community Inn whichever one that fits your field. So I submit to Peer Community in Ecology. There's also Peer Community in Evolutionary Biology, and there are several others that are popping up right now, too. And if there isn't one in your field, you can start one. So, um, so what I really like about Peer Community in is that if you're peer reviewing preprints, um, what you can do is, what that does is that makes it so that people not only see the preprint, which is has to be publicly available in order to submit to Peer Community in. But then um, if the preprint passes peer review at PCI, and now remember this is just researchers, so these are the same people who review your papers anyway. It's just that it's not out of the journal, it's at this um, in this other format called Peer Community In. So if your preprint is recommended by the editor who is taking it through the process, so it's an editor who manages it just like at a journal, and then at least two reviewers, just like at a regular journal. Then um, if it's accepted, then the peer review history is made available online at the Peer Community In website. Your bioarchive preprint is revised so that the peer reviewed version appears there, and then there's a citation to the peer review that happens at PCI. And then that's your final, the final version is the, it's called the paper, which you can then submit to a journal if you want to, or you can keep it where it is. So one of the things that I was able to implement, so aside from this obviously being an open peer review process, which avoids the confidential peer review process, um, what I was additionally able to implement was the peer review of pre-registrations. So you might have heard of uh, registered reports where you submit your study plan to a journal and then it gets a pre-study peer review before you start collecting data. Um, you, if it passes that, you collect your data and you turn uh, the research into a preprint, submit that to BioArchive, and then it goes through its second peer review, which is just a check to make sure you did what you said you were going to do in the first place. And, um, and if not, if there were some changes to the plan, do they still make uh, scientific sense? Are they still scientifically valid? And then it passes that second stage peer review, and then it goes on to be the final version of the preprint, which again, you can submit to a journal or leave where it is. So what, what, how this process at PCI um, differs from a regular registered report is I call it flexible registered report because I'm a biologist, and um, registered reports seem to be really handy for um, psychologists, but my research is field research and is also long-term, and so I have these like big ideas that I want to pre-register, where that can, where each pre-registration could result in multiple different um, articles, and so there's with a register report, it's like a one one pre-registration to one article ratio, and for me, I need it to be more flexible. So um, we started implementing this at, at um, PCI. So now, when we submit our pre our study plan, our pre-registration to, um, so I submit it to PCI Ecology. That's online, so it's online at my GitHub account, so anyone can see it. And then when it passes peer review, that's online. So before I did the study, all this information is already online, and then uh, through the rest of the process as well. So what this does is it allows verification of the whole research, research and evaluation process, because both peer reviews are, are open. 
And it also, by doing the peer review before I do my, by, before I collect the data, it really helps me stop wasting resources because if there was like one change to the methods that could have just made this so much better, um, I can I can do that and I can change that if I submit the peer review before the study happens. Now look, I'm gonna get my research peer reviewed regardless. What does it matter if it's at the beginning or the end? Um, well, it matters a lot to do it at the beginning because you can still change things. So I've been finding, like, as an editor, I have to reject a lot of papers, actually, because um, when I read the intro and methods, oftentimes I find that the methods are not able to answer the question that they propose. And it's really sad because, you know, it would have been fixable if they had gotten the peer review beforehand. So I think this can prevent a lot of um, time from being wasted. So that's one of the cool solutions I, I have for um, how to make the research process verifiable um, by opening up peer review and opening up when you do peer re review and doing it before um, the study is conducted. So the next piece that I wanted to share with you is, um, all right, I'm learning about how to make my research um, more open and the whole research process open. And so uh, one of my big questions was when I had the chance, so let's, I'll back it up a second. Um, in 2017, I had the chance to get my research program going like full speed um, using, well, so Max Planck invested in, in my, my field research so that I could do my, my grand plan, my dream project with these grackles, which are an urban bird species in the Americas. And so at this time, I, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity because I'm just starting to build my lab from scratch to see if, if I build an open and transparent lab, does it actually make my research better and faster? And so I set out to answer this question um, through trial and error. I'm a trial and error kind of learner, so that made sense to me. Now, um, people get really disappointed if I don't include a bird video, so I want to share my bird video with you. Uh, this is my one of the male grackles, um, Mole, and this is him interacting with the touch screen. Now, I'm going, which is one of the um, training, it's a training he has to pass to move on to some experiments. I'm going to see if this video works. Yeah. So we have to touch the white square. And then the food automatically comes up in the hopper, and he eats. And then it goes down, and the white square comes back. And he has to it to get more food. <laughs> and those are the noises the grapples make. Mole is easily distractible, but he comes back. Overall, he was a great worker. This guy would just come down and jump on anything we put in the safe area. That I, I took that video um, over Christmas. It was like Christmas Eve, and he was the first grapple to pass touchscreen training, and we were all so excited. Someone on the team called it a Christmas miracle. So we, uh, yeah, learn how to train grapples, how to use touchscreens. Um, and then after we release them from the aviaries and they go into the wild and we look at their social behavior and their fitness and a variety of other factors. So um, getting to my question of whether these open and transparent research practices make my research um, better and faster, the answer is yes to both questions. To both questions, it saves time and it increases research value. So. Um, this is my workflow. Like, these are the tools that I use to do research from hypothesis and ideas, ideas to the end result of um, a peer-reviewed piece of um, research. And so I want to focus on a couple of things here. Um, my whole workflow is online at this um, Max Planck Institute Innovators blog which um, was a the result of a workshop we just had recently. Um, so I describe how, like, what I love about my workflow and how, how it works. Um, but what I want to share with you right now is that I really get excited about R Markdown, which is a file type that I use in R Studio. And what I do is I write my 
my pre-registrations there. So all the ideas and hypotheses for this one piece of research and um, the predictions, the methods, and the analysis plan. And I usually include our code. Um, when so they can see all of our pre-registrations. They can see us editing our pre-registrations. So I put it there, and then GitHub does version control. And it automatically tracks who's um, updating what on this particular file and when. And that's key for, uh, it also does um, automatic, so the, the track changes are automatic. So you can see like who changed what and what, the, yeah, it's just, it's amazing. And so you don't have it, we save a lot of time in like, we're not emailing files to each other with these random file names that get really confusing. It's just all there online. They do have to learn and I teach them how to use, um, how to edit on GitHub. But it's actually kind of easy, so um, so it's not that bad. Um, so then, what we do when we're ready to submit it for peer review, we send it to Peer Community in Ecology for pre-study peer review. It passes. We collect the data, which is all done online. Um, we don't have paper. We have Google Docs that we use in Google Sheets for um, our protocols and data sheets. So people enter data directly into Google Sheets. And that's awesome because it's automatically version tracked as well and um, backed up, which we do additional backing up at Max Planck Keeper, which you could, if you don't have access to Keeper, you can also do it at OSF, for example, the Open Science Framework. And then we do the study. We submit it for its second peer review at Peer Community and Ecology. And if it passes, then it's um, then out there as the final version on BioArchive. So this is the part of my research process that has been saving me tons of time. It's been massively increasing the value because everyone can see the whole process that I've been engaged in. And it gets me really excited about you know, sharing and learning more about how to do this better. OK, now the fourth and final piece I wanted to touch on with you all is about in how we can incentivize open practices. And we can do that and how we can evaluate people based on ability rather than on um, using our implicit biases. So one thing to know is that there are a lot of barriers to knowledge generation. For example, only people like ourselves, and by ourselves I mean people who are English-speaking academics at wealthy institutions, are can access and generate knowledge. And that is a huge, huge um, tragedy, it's complete discrimination. And it, it, it's not only discrimination, it blocks progress in, in research and applications because we're blocking a whole section of the world from participating in knowledge generation. So increasing diversity in research and researchers can help address this limitation. And, and so I wanted to bring attention here to um, something that John Tennant um, did, which was write a report about Elsevier, against Elsevier, where he's talking about how we need to democratize knowledge. And I think that's particularly relevant, um, knowledge in general, and how it's generated, and um, who can participate. And one way that we can increase this diversity is through this open science MOOC, um, because anyone can access it if they have access to a computer. It's free, people can learn a ton, and find a community to um, get support from, which is a, it was a huge thing for me starting out, you know, in the, this world of starting to question how academia works. Having my supporters was key in helping me keep going and feel like the decisions I was making were the right ones, even though a lot of people will want to fight with you about it, which I've gotten into lots of fights, but <laughs> it really comes down to what I feel like works for me and what I am not willing to compromise on. So this Open Science Make is a wonderful community that can increase diversity in, uh, in research and knowledge generation. The um, prestige as being a barrier to knowledge generation is a big one. And I thought this um, image was really impactful in that in the global north, we really rely on commercial publishers for disseminating our research outputs. Whereas in the south, where they don't have the money to give millions and billions of 
dollars to these publishers. They've got to do it um, grassroots. And so it's scholarly led, financed and owned. And this is how it should be. And if we're locking away research from the global south, this is something we have a responsibility to stop. Because um, I argue that it's prestige, oh, I'll back up one slide, uh, that it's those of us who have prestige are the ones who are defining what prestige is. And so it's another barrier to um, who gets to generate knowledge. And so one of the things we can do to increase diversity and incentivize these open practices is by incentivizing open practices in job advertisements. So if we require, if it's in the essential requirements, the um, universities require you to judge and like rank all applicants based on what you put in the essential requirements of a job ad description. So if you put um, evidence of engaging in open practices or a willingness to engage in open practices as an essential requirement, you have to rank everyone according to this. And so they can score, the people who do have open experience can score higher. And that can be um, a huge shift in terms of now it's coming from top down. All right, everyone engage in open practices, which what I hear from a lot of early career researchers is that we want the top down um, requirements because most early career researchers, well, all of the ones I talk to, want to engage in open practices, and they feel like it's the top that's preventing them from doing it. So if the top is saying, you have to do it, and we're valuing you, you can score higher by doing this. And that's a huge um, flip and a shift in the infrastructure, which which we need. And Chris Chambers and Felix Schoenbrot, um are developing a, a scheme, like um, top... I'm forgetting what it stands for, but um, it's a way of evaluating how open uh, journals are. It's these kinds of solutions that I think are needed to, to proliferate, to, to um, make it more attractive for people to keep um, engaging in these kinds of open practices. Another thing we can do is evaluate ability, not privilege. So. Another thing that I do in my job adverts is that I assess research quality directly. I've signed DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment. Um, so, evaluating ability and privilege um, is important because can be named, like the number of papers you have, or what journal um, names you have, what journals you have your research in. There's a bit of feedback happening, John. I don't know if that's it seems to have stopped now. Um, okay, so metrics can be gamed. So what they are is they're more of a sign of privilege rather than quality of a researcher or a research. For example, women are less likely to be first authors of papers and journals with high impact factors. And so men are more likely to have a, what looks like a good CV, but this is only because of implicit biases, because men are selected for. The thing is, is that we all have implicit biases, right? And for me, I was implicitly biased against women in science a few years ago. I took this test online, uh, the Harvard Implicit Bias Test, which is great, and I was appalled to discover that I was biased against women in science. But it makes sense because men and women were growing up in the same culture, so whatever biases that culture has, um, we have it against ourselves, yet we are coming from one of these groups that can be underrepresented. So it's not about shaming people for having implicit biases, it's about seeing the implicit biases where people tend to be susceptible, and then implementing infrastructure to make it so we can't fall back on them. So I'll, I'll expose a few of the implicit biases that I'm aware of um, next. So one, one thing is in involving um, ratings of scientific quality on the y-axis, and in relation to a research topic, whether it's the topic is gender neutral, so like health and age topics, female types, like infant, gender, and parents topics, or male types, which are journalism and politics topics in this particular study. And what the authors found was that if you are in a gender neutral or female types, um, if you're reading that kind of literature, um, the, the assessment of scientific quality of the male and female authors is pretty similar. But what happens is if you're a female 
publishing in a male typed field. Um, the assessment of the quality of female research goes way down compared to the men's, and the men's goes way up. And so this is not random chance here. Um, I mean, there's no there's no way that female quality, the female author research quality is that much lower than men's in this particular field. So, so it's really, this is where people's implicit biases are coming out. And what happens is that it turns out that risk-taking risk in terms of publishing research is more costly for women in that they're getting a lower payoff, so they get rejected more um, if they're publishing a male-type field. Um, and that doesn't mean that women are more risk-averse. So there was a, a great, there was great research done by Michelle Ryan at the University of Exeter who shows that women are not actually more risk-averse than men. What happens is that she looks at male-dominated fields, surgeons and the police service, and what she does is she um, samples them and when they first start. So in their first year, male and female, um, male is blue, female is red, male and female ambition is about equal in, sur uh, in surgery and in the police service. But what happens is after they have been experiencing that profession for a few years and they've been in the system and they're experiencing implicit biases against them, and sometimes explicit biases, that you see the female ambition severely drop off and male ambition can increase. Um, or in this case, it decreases a bit too, but much um, less so than the female ambition. So it's more that women are having more of a, an accurate reflection of their world. They're less likely to take risks, like apply or interview or do research ask for a promotion because they're less likely to receive a reward for these efforts. And so the underrepresentation of women at the top in terms of voluntary decisions not to pursue leadership may actually be a strategic response to discrimination, is what Michelle Ryan says. And there's evidence to support this from Murray Edwards College at the University of Cambridge, where um, they did this survey of almost a thousand alumna, female alumna of the college, and usually people say, oh, the leaky pipeline, we have women leaving academia, it's due to um, you know, them leaving for reasons. But that's actually not the case. The more dominant reason is having challenges at the workplace, and this is in terms of having a non-supportive workplace culture. So Murray Birds College has, been, has this amazing report on what workplaces can do to make a more supportive workplace culture, and it's really exciting. It's at the link on this website. So some of the things that we can do to tackle these implicit biases, what I've, some of the things I've been doing is I described before the Harvard Implicit Bias Test, which is really uh, informative. Um, the gender language calculator is nice because you can take a job advert or a letter of reference, put the text into this website, and then it will um, tell you whether you're using more masculine words or more feminine words um, in this particular thing. So what I do is I, is I um, make sure all of my job adverts are feminine coded because it means women are more likely to apply and it doesn't discourage men from applying. And what I do for the letters of reference that I write for other people is I make them male coded because their male words are particularly perceived as being stronger in academia. Um, I recruit people via groups that support underrepresented minorities in STEM, and um, one of the things that's been pretty amazing is considering the background of the, piece, the person behind the CV. So does this person have enough privilege to have what's considered a good CV? And if not, I want to look at them as an individual and ignore the fact that they don't have this thing on their CV or that thing on their CV. What opportunities did they have, and what did they do with those opportunities? So that I'm not um, judging just based on privilege. Another thing that I've been learning is, is about, um, I want to consider the evidence before I judge a, a top uh, woman harshly, so a woman in a powerful position. So for example, there was a woman um, professor who a lot of people were saying some nasty things about. but. What, what I was really conscious of doing for myself was recognizing that this person, like, what interactions have I had with this person, and how would I perceive this person if they were a man? And I found that if I relied only on the evidence that I had, 
um, this person was a completely normal human being, just like everyone else. But women who are in top positions can often be judged harshly based on, even if they're doing behaviors that um, are what men do because they're a woman. So that's something I pay a lot of attention to. And then another thing we can do is make sure that 50% of um, speakers at seminars and things and conferences are um, females or underrepresented minorities. And because people need to see role models, if I see myself, where I want to be, then I know I can get there. And there are always well-qualified women or um, minorities to um, to include. And there are some databases. This is the one I know the most about, 500 Women Scientists, where you can request women scientists. And this database is amazing. I use it when I'm planning conferences and things. There's also research that shows that if a woman asks the first question after a talk, that the subsequent question askers are more likely to be gender balanced than if a man asks the first question. And this and a bunch of other research is at um, this website. So uh, it's a good resource. OK, so I've argued that research value increases when it's readable, understandable, and verifiable, and when anyone can generate and disseminate it, regardless of wealth, access to opportunity, perception of prestige, and evaluator implicit biases. And I've argued that we can stop exploiting and discriminating right now because ethical options do exist, they already exist, and we can address our implicit biases. So I will end on um, Bullied into Bad Science, which is the campaign that I and some other early career researchers started um, a, few, a couple of years ago. If you're an early career researcher, you can sign our petition. If you're a non-early career researcher, you can join the list of supporters and um, all the information should be there. I am happy to answer any questions or engage in discussion um, about anything you want to talk about. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corinna. That was <clears throat> inspiring, thought-provoking, and brutally honest. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and we, do, we do have a ton of questions as well. Um, we'll see if we can oh, get cool. through them. Yeah, it's fantastic. The, uh, the chat's been ablaze with people mostly showing love for grackles, but also science. Um, oh. <laughs> so what's it, the, the first question, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit biased with this one, so it's from Lisa Hinker, and she says, do you have any concrete advice on how to limit the influence of Elsevier and similar publishing companies? How to limit the influence? I know, you know, the thing that's frustrating is that if us researchers who are the ones that give them our research products, it really depends on our decisions and where we, what journal put our, our research products in. Mm. So I think like the thing we can do is make better choices, and that's where we're connecting the cost of our publishing, or cost of publishing with our publishing choices. Mm. So um, I mean that's one thing that I think, and that, and now like all of Germany is boycotting all of your subscriptions anyway, uh, and a lot of people are, are refusing to edit or review for them as well. Um, I know a society journal who um, has, is published by Elsevier, and right now they're trying to get out of their contract because the, of all the boycotting that's happening, mm -hmm. they're afraid that they can't, they can't read behind the paywalls. And it's true. So um, I think this kind of pressure from the different angles is really key. Um, so all of the refusing to donate time services mm -hmm. um, and getting the governments involved. I think it's, it's starting to have an impact on academia. It probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference for us, but it's making a difference for us. Sure. It's just sort of abiding by your ethics, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So there's, there's a follow-up question to that from, um, from Ian Lahart, and he asks, um, do publishers provide a breakdown of their costs? So, for example, he set up a registered reports online journal and the estimated cost of publishing there is about 20 bucks, 20, 20 pounds. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So it depends on the publisher. Um, good luck trying to get that information from us if you're uh, the other big, big, big publishers. No way, no way are that. And if they do give a number, like if they don't give numbers, but I know that in the contracts that societies sign with them to publish their journals. So, so, so the contract between the society and Elsevier. Mm -hmm. Elsevier says that they give 50% of the profits to the journals. In general, I know that Wiley does this too. Um, but like 50% of what profits? And where are all these numbers coming from? 
And it doesn't really make sense that, yeah, none of it makes sense. And there's no way of getting that information. We will never give it. But there are some publishers who have put their whole um, budget out there. One of them is eLife. Um, that's a journal, and they publish, right, they publish their own journal. Um, Peer Community Inn just published a blog post on the economics of oh, the Journal of Open Source Software um, that ha manages a back-end platform. They um, put up the, the costs of publishing for them and you know, for all of these. It's like 200 euros per year or something. You know, it's like really low in terms of the mm -hmm, actual mm -hmm. costs. <clears throat> It's incredible. Although, what's it with uh, with Plan S? I think one of the requirements there is that publishers have to be more transparent about their costs. Like, it's completely unclear what that actually means at the moment. You know, they're probably just gonna go, "This is how much we like to make." Uh, you know, this is like the, our, our this is what they've done beforehand. Like to calculate to calculate article processing charges, they say this is the revenue that we're getting now. This is the amount of articles that we intend to publish. Therefore, this is how much it costs to create these articles. It's like that's not really how this works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not in the not in the slightest. Um, okay, anyway, final question. Exactly. Hmm? It, it's insanity. Uh, right. So, final one from Ian. I quite like this one as well. Um, and maybe we can keep going. But he says, "How can we make editors more accountable, given the immense power that they exert?" Yeah, that's a really good question. And when I became an editor at Royal Society of Open Science, I had a lot of questions about how to be an editor. And so I asked the senior editor, and I just had like we had a lot of these conversations. Hmm. But I realized that it was just depending on me and what I felt like asking. And I thought, you know, there should be first of all training across the board for how to be an editor. They there are guidelines that come with the journal, but they're not. Um, they're pretty general, and there are all these situations that happen where, oh, okay, what do I do now? You know, what should I do in this situation? Um, so I think that it does have, I think there's a responsibility for the journals to make sure that there is quality control happening, that they're exerting quality control, because it's their journal, you know? And it's, that's where the evaluation process is happening. If, if I mean, because... One thing that has been apparent is we cannot rely on researchers to self-control. You know, like, there needs to be infrastructure in place to prevent all of these um, bad practices from happening. Mm, yeah. You are now unmuted. Oh, now I'm muted. Okay, right, final one, because, again, it's close to my heart. <clears throat> it's from Lisa again. And she says, do you have any thoughts on how to build a stronger, more densely connected open science community? Because there are a lot of individual or institutional level projects, major, major shout out, um, but how can we bring these efforts together and increase their impact? Yeah. Um, Brian Nosek is starting this, he just, there's this database that is being compiled with all of the grassroots open initiatives, and he just made a, um, a Google forum for all of us to participate in. So I'm there holding stuff about science. And I thought that was kind of a nice way to bring people together. It just started, so I don't know if that's going to be like, super active. Um, you are now but active. I think that for me, where a lot of these things meet is on Twitter. So um, I when I want information on I'm, I'm looking for answers for something I, I i'm researching something like how should i do this better um i ask on twitter and that seems to be where a lot of open people are are gathering and and that's that to me feels like that's where i go for my open community aside from like individuals who i know and i'll individually reach out to but if there are other i'm sure there are other resources out there that might be really i um, feel like more of a community as well i'm I think for me, these are the ones that stand out. You are now unmuted. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Corinna. It's we, we went two minutes over the time. Bad, bad Germaning. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much. You know, if anyone's still listening, a uh, little round of applause and, and you know, send your thanks and love across the across the ether, uh, Corinna. That was perfect. Um, we will re make this uh, available online after I've edited a couple of little bits out. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Like, you know, I think, yeah, there's a lot for us all to reflect on that. Hmm? Um, if people want to ask me some questions on Twitter, the hmm. ones that I wasn't able to get to, I'm happy to, to answer them there. Um, mm -hmm. where it's, 
all out there. Um, yep. I'm looking through them. It's awesome. Thanks so much for joining everyone. Yep. Thank really you all for fun. listening and for all the great questions. Like, yeah, there's plenty to get back. And um, apologies for all the feedback on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take it easy for now, everyone. I'll see if I can close this down.